So this dinner roll recipe, I first started making when my husband's grandma, who was like the family baker, everything was measured to grandma's. So when I stepped into his family, grandma was all the holidays, like it's like, oh, grandma's rolls, grandma's strawberry jam, grandma all, grandma's pumpkin roll. You guys have seen a lot of Grandma Lucille's recipes um, in my books and on the YouTube channel. But grandma reached the point where she didn't want, she physically wasn't able to prepare all of the stuff from scratch anymore. And so making dinner rolls fell to me. So let me tell you the pressure, the first Thanksgiving dinner, when I am the one who is making the rolls and everybody has this level of what grandma's were. So these were the rolls that I made. And I knew I had success when my sister-in-law I made homemade croissants one year instead of bringing these rolls. Yes, homemade croissants. I'm talking three days. They were beautiful and phenomenal as well. I, I'm bragging on myself, but they really were good. And so here I bring these homemade croissants and she's like, you didn't bring your rolls. She's like, your rolls are the only whole wheat from scratch rolls that I like. So now I know that I always have to bring dinner rolls and pies to any of our holidays and if I wanna bring croissants, that's fine, but the dinner rolls have to come. So I'm gonna be sharing this recipe with you. Now, if you have a copy of my book, The Made From Scratch Life, this is the dinner roll recipe on page 187. But if you don't have a copy of my book, no worries. There is a printable version of this recipe, including if you're gonna be using fresh ground flour. And if you don't have fresh ground flour, we'll also have the alterations or the amounts to use if you're just using all purpose or whole wheat flour from the store. So you can get that link below, head over to the blog post and click on that printable version. But we are going to begin this with a half a cup of warm water. And so we're gonna put that in our mixing bowl. And then two and a quarter teaspoons of yeast. So I just use active dry yeast. I buy it in this big old bag whenever I can get it in bulk. But this is also the equivalent if you just have the little individual packets of yeast. Two and a quarter teaspoons is the equivalent of one of those packets as well. And this one I'm getting at the end. And I store the, my yeast in the fridge, especially if you are buying it in bulk. It just helps it stay fresher longer. And you can also store it in the freezer as well. But I tend to go through mine quick enough that the fridge just works fine for me. And then we're just gonna mix that in. So the warm water is just gonna help activate this yeast. So we're just gonna get that. And you'll see it start to turn foamy. Those are all good signs. So we're just gonna let that sit in there while we get the rest of our ingredients measured out, and then we'll start adding. So now we're gonna add the rest of our ingredients, and up next is a half a cup of buttermilk. If you wanna learn how to make your own cultured buttermilk, then you can catch this video. But we're gonna do a half cup, and the reason that we're gonna do buttermilk, you could also do yogurt, um, is one, is the acidity in it actually helps create a better textured product. And then you've got the fat from the milk, so that also increases the texture and makes it taste better. It's more, it's enriched, so it's usually softer, a little bit fluffier um, than if you're just using all water. And then we've got an egg. Get that in there. Thank you, chickens. And then a half a cup of softened butter. Mine's a little bit more on the liquefied side than soft, but it's all going to work. Now, you could use, if you're dairy free, then you can use softened coconut oil, works just fine. And then you could use, um, I like coconut milk with baking because coconut milk still has a nice good um, fat level in it. And that will work as well. I like the flavor that the honey imparts. You could use sugar, but then you'll need to add a little bit additional amount of either water or the buttermilk. But I feel like the honey just gives it phenomenal flavor. And we need a quarter cup. And then I just like to mix all of these ingredients together. Once we add in our flour and salt, they'll get mixed together a lot better, but I just kind of like to give them just a cursory stir. 
Now, if you don't have a flour mill and you can't grind your own flour, that's completely fine. You can make this recipe all using all-purpose flour or using whole wheat flour from the store. I have found as far as texture goes and flavor that my family likes this the best, per sister-in-law's praise, uh, using a mixture of unbleached organic all-purpose flour and fresh ground spelt. So spelt is a ancient grain, so it's really great because it has, it does have gluten in it, but it's a different gluten than what we have in our modern wheat. And so a lot of times people who may have issues with gluten sensitivities can handle the spelt. So I really like spelt. It has a kind of like a nutty flavor. It works really well in pastry items. However, dinner rolls are not pastry. And so I like to mix the spelt flour with some of the all purpose because it I feel like it rises better. Spelt, if you've ever cooked with spelt flour or baked with spelt flour, it has a tendency to want to spread out and not go up. So I found that when doing bread items like rolls, if I mixed these two together, so then I have a little bit different protein and gluten count with the organic all-purpose flour, then I just it acts almost like I'm using all-purpose, but then we get the benefit of using over half of the flour in the ratio of the spelt. So we're gonna get this ground. I need a total of two and a half cups if using spelt. That's the thing with fresh ground flour and using different kinds of flour. You have to adapt recipes based upon the type of wheat or grain that you're grinding. So make sure if you're not using fresh ground spelt or spelt flour in this recipe that you grab the printable recipe card and then use it on the measurements for the exact flour that you're gonna be using. So we're gonna get this turned on. All right, so that's a little over a cup, pretty close. say a quarter and a tablespoon. And for the spelt, we need two and a half cups. So that is all of the fresh ground spelt, but now we need to add one and three quarters cup of the all-purpose flour. Okay. And it's a teaspoon salt, but my butter is salted butter, so I am going to do a scant teaspoon, probably more about three quarters of a teaspoon rather than a full. Now we're just gonna mix so that we don't have any dry flour and incorporate this together. And I am gonna be using my stand mixer to knead this, but if you don't have a stand mixer, you can do this by hand. Anytime I'm mixing up dough, I love this dough whisk rather than just using a spoon. It just incorporates all the ingredients a lot easier and more thoroughly than I have found with using a regular spoon. I just love this. So we want with this dough, we want it to be scraping so you can see where it's coming clean on the sides here. But whenever you're doing whole wheat, spelt included, any type of whole wheat, fresh ground flour, you want to keep the dough on the wet and more sticky side. And the reason for that is because fresh ground flour absorbs moisture. So if you have this really dry in the beginning in about 10 to 15 minutes, it's going to absorb even more of the moisture and it's gonna be really dry. And that's why when people are first using fresh ground flour, they usually end up with really dense, hard products. It's because they don't understand the difference in moisture content that we have been taught or are used to if we're using something like all-purpose store-bought flour. So you want it to remain a little bit on the sticky side, not super wet. Like I said, this is not really clinging to the sides of the bowl. But if I touch this, 
like it is kind of sticking to my fingers. So you can see that that's sticking a little bit. It's not that smooth like a baby's butt that we're always taught to do when we're using all-purpose flour and you're kneading dough. So this is ideal. You want to leave this on this slightly tacky, little bit sticky, wet side because that's how you're gonna get a great texture on the finished product. So we do need to knead this and you can knead it by hand. And to knead it by hand when you've got this wetter dough, instead of putting a bunch of flour uh, down on the countertop or flouring your hands, you just wanna use like a little bit of olive oil or coconut oil, whatever oil of your choice is. Um, and then that will keep it from sticking. However, if you have a mixer, then we're just gonna use the kneading attachment And we're gonna knead this, but we're only going to knead it for about four minutes, and then we're gonna give it a rest. And the reason for that is the way, especially with spelt, because it's more of a flat, fragile gluten content than what we're used to in uh, more modern wheats that is predominantly what most of America and what most people are baking with. If you knead it for six to eight minutes straight, like you would all-purpose flour or bread flour, um, you end up with a dense product. And so I found that by shortening the kneading time and then letting it rest for a little bit and then coming back really tends to improve the texture. So we're just gonna need this for four minutes. So you want it to come together where it's all in a ball. And then you should be able to just go like this and scrape that down off of your kneading attachment. And then we're going to check for a window pane test. And so you can see this is not as sticky as it was when we first put it in there. So it's still a little bit uh, tacky, but it doesn't stick as much and it's holding shape. So this is what you're after. So Sometimes I'll let it go for four minutes and then I'm gonna do a test of the dough. So you're gonna just pinch off like, well, about, I don't know, a little bit smaller than a golf ball size bit of dough. And then you're gonna take your, this is called a window pane test. And so then you're going to pull this apart with your fingers and stretch it thin. And it should hold, and when you put it up to light, you should be able to see through it. So it, you should be able to see light coming through there. If it starts to tear before you can get it to spread thin like that, then you know that it needs to be kneaded a little bit longer. So if at four minutes you do the window pane test and it it's just breaks, let it rest for about four minutes and then knead it for another two minutes and then do the window pane test, which is what I did just here. So this is just at six minutes of kneading time, but there's that four minute rest period in between and that helps it stay nice and tender and flaky dough. So we're gonna oil this dough and the bowl and then let it sit and rise. This is just so it doesn't all stick because it's still tacky. Um, and it will continue to absorb just a tad bit of moisture, but as this is sitting, there we go. Um, I don't want it to dry at, out, excuse me, I don't want this to dry out while it's rising for the first hour. So I'm just gonna use a little bit of avocado oil and give that a spray. You can just smear it in too if you've got, don't have a spray one. And then we're just gonna put this dough back in. And then now the top is coated, plop that upside down. And then we're just gonna cover this with a tea towel. And I'm gonna put it in a warm, warm area, which I'm gonna be baking here in just a little bit so that back burner of my stove will be nice and warm. And so I'm just gonna let that rise for about an hour. You want it to double in size. If your room's really cold, it may take it like an hour and 10, 20 minutes. If your room is really warm, it could be as fast as 45 minutes, but we just want it to be averagely doubled in size and then we'll form our rolls. All right, so this has been rising for, oh, right at about an hour and nine minutes because I got busy. So now we're just gonna take this dough out. And as I said, it's not quite as tacky. So you can see that this is coming clean even more so than it did earlier. So now we want to form our rolls. So I love to have my rolls rise and bake 
in cast iron or a circular dish. Um, I feel like the cast iron, I just happen to love cast iron no matter what, but I actually feel like it's superior baking. However, if you don't have any cast iron skillets, you can just use a nine by 13 or whatever size pan that you have that is safe to put into the oven. So some people like to weigh their dough and then exactly divide it by like 12 or however many rolls they have. I generally am not pulling out the scale to weigh each roll when I'm doing it. So I just kind of do it by eye and I remember that I want these rolls to double in size. So I just pinch off a piece of the dough. And so you can see, like I said, it's a little bit tacky at this point, but it's nowhere near as sticky as when we first started. So I just usually pick off a piece about, oh, palm of your hand there. And then you want to form this by creating the tension on the top. So you can see I'm pulling down and then I'm kind of pinching it on the bottom here. So I'm pulling and pinching this together. So that creates that nice smooth top and it creates that tension. So as this rises, it's going to hold its shape. And then also putting it in a circular pan also helps as these rise, once they meet, then instead of rising out, then they're going to rise up and that creates a nice texture on your roll. So now we wanna let these rise until they're about double in size. And with all things bread and yeast and or sourdough, the warmer it is, the faster they're going to rise, the cooler it is. So it's more judging on when they have doubled in size or they're the size that you want them to be. Keeping in mind that when they hit that hot oven, they will puff up and rise just a smidge more than what they are at room temperature. So kind of judge the moisture content of the rolls with your fingers when you're rolling them. These are pretty good. There was actually a couple of rolls here. This dough was a little bit drier. So you can either um, take just a little bit of oil in your hand and kind of smear it over the top because we don't want them to dry out while they're rising. Another option is to take your tea towel that we're gonna cover these as they're rising just to keep bugs and dust and whatnot off of them. Um, and you can actually spritz this with a little bit of water and get it damp and then put it over the top of them and that will also help to keep some of the moisture in there. So kind of whatever your preference is. So it has been right at an hour and you can see these guys have doubled in size. They're all touching. So now when they hit the heat of the oven, they're gonna go up and rise even more. And these guys are close to touching, but not quite as much. So we've preheated the oven to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Don't bake with that in there. And 12 to 15 minutes. So I always start with the shortest amount of time um, and then we'll add more if they don't look quite done. Right. So you wanna pull them out just as they start to turn golden brown on top which is a little bit harder to tell when you have the fresh ground whole wheat in there because they're already slightly brown, but you can see where they're just starting to brown. And then be quite careful because these are extremely hot still, but the key is slathering the top of these bad boys with butter while they are still warm right out of the oven. I'm of the firm belief in a recipe, one can never have too much garlic. And I don't know that one can have too much butter. So you wanna let these cool at least a half an hour because if you cut into bread products when they're still really hot, then the center can get a little bit gummy. But it's so hard to wait because it's fresh buttered rolls and it smells phenomenal. So I wanna show you guys the texture of these. So just use my little butter knife here because you can see where these, once they were rising, that they touched together. I'm gonna to pull that out. Oh, yes. Look at that. This, see how soft this is? I know it's really hard for you to tell on camera, but this is incredibly soft for a whole wheat with fresh ground flour roll. And the only thing that makes this better than it is right now, yes, more butter.
This is really good. I feel like the summer is so busy with all of the harvest and the preserving that I typically don't bake a lot until we just start to come back into the fall and the holidays. I'm like, oh, I missed you. So if you want more from scratch holiday recipes, make sure that you get my recipe and watch the video on how to make green bean casserole completely from scratch. No store-bought condensed soup allowed with the special ingredient that is not butter, surprise, that makes everything taste better. And you can also go to the website and get the printable version of this roll recipe as well.